Looking to protect your cards? Whether you need sleeves, deck boxes, binders, playmats, or even backpacks, Ultimate Guard has your collection covered. Literally. Premium products offering priceless protection. Visit ultimateguard.com. Hello everyone, today I'm doing something a little bit different as I'll be showcasing my Paper Commander deck. This is my Hanzi Toolbox deck. I was given the Riveteers Rampage Starter deck, which I've slowly upgraded over time. And this is now up to date up until the Baldur's Gate expansion. So if you're maybe watching this in the future and you're wondering why I haven't included certain cards, that's the reason why. So I've split up the deck into a few different categories, which I'll go over one by one. And then at the end of the video, I'll give some more strategy tips and tricks. And I'll go over all the accessories that I use for my paper deck as well. But first let's read our commander, a 3 mana 3-3 three, three legendary devil rogue, saying each creature spell we cast with mana value 4 or greater has blitz, and the blitz cost is equal to its mana cost. So blitz means the creature comes into play, it gains haste, and says when this creature dies, draw a card, and we have to sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. And then the blitz costs you pay costs one generic less for each time you've cast your commander from the command zone this game. So the first time we play Hansi, let's say on turn 3, we already get that one mana discount. And as the game goes on, the opponents are likely to remove our commander. That cost will only increase over time. So we can easily cast some of our more expensive creatures at a very cheap cost thanks to blitz. So the goal of our deck is to include lots of creatures that can benefit from entering the battlefield, from attacking and from dying. Since those are the three main stages of a creature in this deck, we're gonna play it, we're gonna attack with it, and it's gonna die to either blitz or the opponent blocking or killing it. So we want to try and extract as much value out of our creatures as possible, since they won't be sticking around for long. The first category we're going to take a closer look at are the ramp cards, because we are playing lots of expensive creatures in this deck, and we also want to be able to replay Hansi over and over again if he gets answered, so we get a bigger discount when blitzing our creatures. So first things first, of course, we're playing Soul Ring as most commander decks. We're not going to play too many other signets or ramp artifacts, because we have lots of synergy with putting additional lands on the battlefield, so that's going to be the better way of ramping, and typically in multiplayer games there's fewer answers to opposing lands than there are opposing artifacts so ramping with our various sorceries is going to be a safer investment over time but soul ring is still too good not to include as it can give us a huge mana boost in the early turns next we have a whole host of two mana ramp cards with sakura tribe elder which we can sacrifice to get a basic nature's lore and three visits can search up a forest card to put onto the battlefield untapped and we do have quite a few forests in the deck, including some non-basic forests as well that we can search up. Then Rampant Growth can find any basic to put on the battlefield tapped. Farseek can search for a swamp, mountain, plains or island. So the swamp and mountain part is relevant, since once again we have quite a few dual lands that we can still find with Farseek. And then finally Explore can play an additional land this turn and draw a card. So these are all ways to ramp on turn 2. Then we have some more expensive green ramp sorceries with Cultivate and Kodama's Reach, each finding two basic lands and putting one on the battlefield tapped. And then Migration Path at 4 mana can find two basics to put on the battlefield tapped, can also be cycled for 2 mana if we just want to draw a card in the late game. And Sky Shroud Claim can find two forest cards to put on the battlefield untapped, so once again can also find our non-basic forests. And then of course we can also use our creatures to ramp, either when they enter the battlefield or die. And then Heartless Summoning is an awesome 2 mana enchantment that gives our creatures a 2 mana discount, but it does come with a drawback, all our creatures get minus 1, minus 1. And then we've got Solemn Simulacrum, which when it enters can find a basic to put on the battlefield tapped, and when it dies we get to draw a card, so if we blitz the Solemn we get to draw 2. And then a Rampant Rejuvenator is a Hydra that enters with two plus one plus one counters on it. And when it dies, we get to search our library for X basic land cards, where X is the Rejuvenator's power, and then put them on the battlefield. So a bit of a number with Heartless Summoning, but otherwise Rejuvenator can draw us a card with Blitz and Ramp 2. And then a Seed Guide Ash, a 5 mana 4-4. Four, four. When it is put into a graveyard from play, we may search our library for up to 3 forest cards and put them into play tapped. So another great way to ramp while drawing cards and maybe attacking an opponent with a 4-4. Four, four. 
So now that we've taken a look at all our ramp cards, it's time to take a look at some creatures to blitz into play. And the first subset of creatures are ways to remove opposing creatures from the battlefield, starting with a Ravenous Chupacabra at 4 mana, a 2-2, and very simply when it enters the battlefield, destroy target creature an opponent controls. Then at 6 mana there's Cemetery Desecrator, a 4-4 with Menace, and when it enters the battlefield or dies, we get to exile another card from a graveyard, and when we do, either remove X counters from target permanent, where X is the mana value of the exiled card, or target creature an opponent controls gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is once again the mana value of the exiled card. So if we blitz Desecrator into play, it will trigger when it enters, and once again when it dies, so we get to potentially take out two creatures, can also remove loyalty counters of opposing planeswalkers, so it's quite versatile and also gives us a bit of graveyard hate. Then Noxious Gearhulk is similar to Chupacabra, also gaining life equal to the destroyed creature's toughness on a 5-4 with Menace. And Coglatha Titan Ape, a 7-6, when it enters the battlefield it fights up to one target creature we don't control, and when it attacks we can destroy target artifact or enchantment defending player controls. So if we blitz Kogla, we not only fight an opposing creature, but we immediately get to take out an artifact or enchantment, and can also pay one on a green to return a human we control to its owner's hand, and make Kogla indestructible until end of turn. We don't have very many humans in the deck, but there are a few cool synergies we can maybe pull off by returning a creature back to our hand. And then Massacre Worm gives us a sweeper for small creatures, giving all opposing creatures minus two minus two until end of turn when it enters. And whenever a creature an opponent controls is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, that player also loses two life on a 6-5 Worm. And Deathbringer Regent is a great reset button if we need to wipe the board, a 5-6 Flying Dragon, and when it enters the battlefield, if we cast it from our hand, including with Blitz, and there are 5 or more author creatures on the battlefield, then destroy all author creatures. Then Tree Shaker Chimera, an 8-5, saying all creatures able to block Chimera do so, and when it dies we also get to draw 3 cards, so we can instantly attack with our Chimera, force the opponent to block with one of their valuable creatures, often trade the Chimera in the process, and to draw three cards, so what's not to love? And then last but certainly not least, Archon of Cruelty, 8 mana for a 6-6, and when it enters the battlefield or attacks, target opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker, discards a card and loses 3 life, while we get to draw a card and gain 3 life. So this can also trigger twice the turn we blitz it, so it can provide a ton of advantage while wrecking the opponent's board. And then we also have a few creatures that can deal with opposing non-creature permanents. Druid of Purification is a 2-3. When it enters the battlefield, starting with you, each player may choose an artifact or enchantment you don't control and to destroy each permanent chosen this way. And Woodfall Primus, an 8-mana 6-6 Trampler. When it enters the battlefield, destroy target non-creature permanent. And it also has Persist, so when it dies, if it didn't have any minus 1, minus 1 counters on it, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a minus 1, minus 1 counter on it, so it can destroy another non-creature permanent when it enters. With so many of our creatures dying, it also makes sense to include some graveyard recursion, and Timeless Witness at 4 mana can still be blitzed with Henzi, unlike Eternal Witness, and when it enters we can return any card from our graveyard to our hand, it can also be eternalized from our graveyard for 7 mana if we exile it, in which case it enters as a 4-4 zombie token that still has that same ability. Green Warden of Morassa is a bigger version of Timeless Witness, a 5-4 that can return any card from our graveyard to our hand when it enters, and when it dies, we exile it, and we get to do it once again. Phyrexian Delver is a 5 mana 3 2, and when it enters the battlefield, return target creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield, and we lose life equal to that card's converted mana cost. And then Mikaeus the Unhallowed can set up some fun combos, but I try not to go for any infinite combos. A 5 5 with Intimidate, so it cannot be blocked except by artifact creatures, and in this case, black creatures, says whenever a human deals damage to us, destroy it, and other non human creatures we control get plus on plus one and half undying, and most of the creatures in our deck are non-human, and undying means when a creature with undying dies, if it didn't have any plus one plus one counters on it, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a plus one plus one counter on it, potentially re-enabling any enters the battlefield abilities as well. 
And at 7 mana, Moldgraf Monstrosity is an 8-8 Trampler, and when it dies, exile it and return two creature cards at random from your graveyard to the battlefield. And finally, Artisan of Kozilek, a 9 mana 10-9 Eldrazi with Annihilator 2, so whenever this creature attacks, defending player sacrifices two permanents, which we can enable right away thanks to Blitz. And when we cast the Artisan, we may return target creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield, so that can also reanimate a creature. And then we've got a couple Chonkers that can gain life when they enter the battlefield or die, including Demogoth Woe Eater, a 4 mana 7 6, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice a creature, but we're easily gonna skip that step since we're just gonna blitz the Woe Eater instead. And then when we sacrifice the Woe Eater, including with Blitz, each opponent discards a card while we draw a card and gain two life, so we can essentially draw two cards that way. The Workshop War Chief, a 5-3 Trampler. When it enters the battlefield, we gain 3 life, and when it dies, we make a 4-4 Rhino Warrior token. Thrak Tusk gains 5 life when it enters on a 5-3 Beast, and when it leaves the battlefield, we make a 3-3 Beast token. And finally, Palaka Worm, a 7 mana 7-7 seven, seven Trampler. When it enters, we gain 7 life, and when it dies, we draw a card, so we can once again draw 2 cards when it dies with Blitz. And then we've got a couple creatures that can find authors when they die. Gamekeeper, a 4 mana 2 2. When it dies, we may exile it. And if we do reveal cards from the top of our library until we reveal a creature card and put that card onto the battlefield and the rest into our graveyard. And Protean Hulk, 7 mana 6 6. When it dies, search your library for any number of creature cards with total converted mana cost 6 or less and put them onto the battlefield. So this can be a huge combo enabler, but for the most part, we're just trying to get a lot of value with our Protean Hulk. Then I've got two Titans with a Grave Titan, a 6 6 Death Touch. When it enters or attacks, make a pair of 2 2 black zombie creature tokens. And Inferno Titan, a 6 6 that has Fire Breathing. And whenever it enters or attacks, we can divide 3 damage as we choose among 1, 2, or 3 targets. And then I've got more dragons, including ones from Kamigawa, which trigger when they die, so great synergy with Blitz. And then the Ancient Dragons also hugely benefit from the haste that we get from Blitz. So we've got the Midnight Sky, 5 mana, 5-5 five, five, Flyer with Menace, and when it dies, either each opponent discards two cards and loses two life, or puts target non-dragon creature card from any graveyard onto the battlefield under our control at the cost of two life. The Boundless Sky, a 4-4 with Flying and Death Touch, and when it dies, either search your library for up to three land cards, they can be any lands, reveal them and put them into our hands, or we can make an XX Green Spirit Creature Token, where X is the number of lands we already control, and the Evening Star, a 6 mana 5-5 five, five with flying, and when it dies, each opponent loses 5 life, and we gain life equal to the life lost this way. Ancient Copper Dragon is a 6 mana 6-5 six, flyer, and when it deals combat damage to a player, roll a d20, and we create a number of treasure tokens equal to the result. And finally, Ancient Brass Dragon, 7 mana 7-6 seven, flyer, and when it deals combat damage to a player, roll a d20, and when we do, put any number of target creature cards with total mana value X or less from graveyards onto the battlefield under our control, so it can also lead to some very exciting moments. And then I've got some more fun red creatures like Vengeful Ancestor, 4 mana, 3 4 flyer. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, goad a target creature. So until your next turn, that creature attacks each combat if able and attacks a player author, then you if able. And then whenever a goaded creature attacks, it deals 1 damage to its controller. Not gonna happen since we're probably gonna blitz the ancestor, so it's not gonna stick around. Balor is a 5 mana 5 5 flyer, and when it attacks or dies, we get to choose one or more, and each mode must must target a different player, and there's a ton of different options. Either target opponent draws three cards and then discards three cards at random, target opponent sacrifices a non-token artifact, or Balor deals damage to target opponent equal to the number of cards in their hand. So Balor can also trigger twice if we blitz it. Ilharg the Race Boar, 5 mana 6-6 six, six, Trampler, and when it attacks, we may put a creature card from our hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking, and return that creature to our hand at the beginning of the next end step, so it can be a way to repeatedly gain value from certain creatures. And when Ilharg dies or is put into exile from the battlefield, we may put it into its owner's library third from the top, as it's one of these legendary gods. And then Itali Primal Storm, also very fun, 6 mana 6-6, six, six. when it attacks, exile the top card of each player's library, and then we may cast any number of spells from among those cards without paying their mana costs, so it can also be great if we can enable it with Blitz. 
Okay, that covers all the creatures in the deck. Now it's time to take a look at some non-creature cards, including removal, and we have a few different sweeper effects, starting with Calling Ritual, 4 mana to destroy each non-land permanent with mana value 2 or less, and we get to add black or green for each permanent destroyed this way. So that's another reason not to include any cheap ramp artifacts in our deck outside of Soul Ring, since this will blow them all up, and since we don't have many cheap permanents ourselves, it's mostly going to be one-sided. Then Damnation to destroy all creatures, they cannot be regenerated. Blasphemous Act is a 9 mana sorcery, but costs 1 less to cast for each creature on the battlefield, and then deals 13 damage to each creature and finally wind grace's judgment gives us more spot removal a five mana instant and for any number of opponents destroy target non-land permanent that player controls so it gives us more answers to artifacts and enchantments as well and then we've got some sacrifice engines these are artifacts and enchantments that can help us sacrifice our creatures before they die to blitz so we can gain more value before the creature goes away evolutionary leap a two mana enchantment can pay a green mana and sacrifice a creature to reveal cards from the top of our library until we reveal a creature card and then put that card into our hand the rest on the bottom in a random order then birthing pod i didn't get a chance to play much of in standard or modern back in the day but is a ton of fun can pay two life alongside three mana thanks to the phyrexian mana cost and then two life and one mana to activate it as opposed to a green and then a sacrifice a creature and search our library for a creature card with converted mana cost equal to one plus the sacrifice creatures converted mana cost and put that card straight onto the battlefield so it can be a ton of fun to go up the chain and gain more value as we go along and then a greater good for mana enchantment lets us sacrifice a creature at any point to draw cards equal to the sacrifice creature's power and then a discard three cards although most of the creatures in our deck have more than three power so we'll gain a significant card advantage now this is potentially a way to infinitely enable Mikaeus alongside woodfall primus so i kind of lied when i said i don't have an infinite combo in the deck but we are still limited by the number of cards in our library so we can't quite destroy all non-land permanents repeatedly but that's not the main goal of greater good it's mostly here as a nice card draw engine but uh, just a side note worth pointing out and then industrial advancement a four mana enchantment saying at the beginning of your end step you may sacrifice a creature if you do look at the top x cards of your library where x is that creature's mana value and you may put a creature card from among them onto the battlefield so it can also be incredibly powerful and then our final non-land card is sundial of the infinite a two mana artifact can pay one mana and tap it to end the turn can only activate this during our turn it's a pretty bizarre card but the purpose of sundial is a way to prevent us from sacrificing our creature to blitz so what happens is we blitz our creature it enters with haste and the ability when this creature dies draw a card and then we also have to sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step we wait until our end step let the sacrifice trigger go on the stack and then activate our sundial of the infinite so we no longer have to sacrifice our creature since all the triggers are removed from the stack to end the turn and then our creature still has haste and keeps the ability to draw a card when it dies so this is a pretty interesting rules interaction and just kind of a fun way to keep our creatures on the battlefield so we don't have to sacrifice them to blitz and then it's time to go over the lands in the deck and there's 42 total which is quite a bit but again our deck is quite mana hungry as you can see a lot of expensive cards in the deck and we've got a ton of basic lands as well to search up with our various ramp spells to make sure that we don't run out i've got three swamps in the deck two mountains and four forests but again we do have some other dual lands that also have the forest type that we can still search up with some of our other ramp sorceries and i don't have a ton of foil cards in this deck but since we're searching up our basic lands so often i went ahead and uh, got some foil full art basic lands which look awesome here and i went with a capenna art since they fit with our commander and then as i mentioned i've got some of these dual lands and even a trial land with a basic land types so ziatora's proving ground can also be cycled We've got Blood Crypt, a Swamp Mountain, Overgrown Tomb, a Swamp Forest, and Stomping Ground, a Mountain Forest, which can come into play untapped at the cost of 2 life. And then a Woodland Chasm and Highland Forest are snow lands that also have the basic land types and come into play tapped. Could also update them now with a new dual lands from Dominaria United, which also have these basic land types. And then I've got some fetch lands, which can help us find our basic lands. In the case of Fabled Passage, comes into play untapped if we control four or more lands. 
And then I've got the fetch lands that cost one life to activate since I had these left over from my modern decks. And these can find any mountain or swamp in the case of Bloodstained Mire. So this can also find our shock lands and the tri land we just looked at. And then Verdant can find swamp and forest and Wooded Foothills can find mountain or forest. I don't recommend getting these if you're on a budget, but they're nice to have for additional mana fixing. And then I've got some more dual land cycles with a check lands coming into play untapped if we control their respective basic land types. We've got the pathways, can either play them as their front side or the back side. And then the commander dual lands, which are untapped if we have two or more opponents. And then rounding out my dual lands, there's Deathcap Glade and Rockfall Veil vale from Innistrad. Got some Filter lands with a Shadow Blood Ridge, Twilight Mire, and Mossfire Valley. And then one Temple of Malady, which also came in the starter deck. And Command Tower, of course, a must have in any multicolor commander deck. I've left out Haunted Ridge since the price went up quite a bit recently, as it's seeing a lot of play in the Black Rat Pioneer decks. And finally, there's a few more utility lands, including the ones with Hideaway, Spine Rock Knoll, and Moss Ward Bridge. The Knoll we can enable if an opponent was dealt. 7 or more damage this turn, and a Mossward Bridge if we control creatures with total power 10 or greater, so these can help us cast an additional card for free. Then Malachi Rebirth can either be a 1 mana instant to save our creature and return it to the battlefield once it dies, which can also potentially help us re-enable and enter the battlefield ability, but can also be played as a tap land. And then the combo of Urborg with Cabal Coffers is quite nice, can maybe find it with a Boundless Sky if it dies when we get to search up 3 lands. Urborg turning all lands into swamps, and then Cabal Coffers can pay 2 mana, tap it, adding black for each swamp we control, so that can also give us a huge mana boost despite being a 3 color deck. And then a Temple of the False God is also quite good if we're ramping with our various green sorceries, putting additional lands in play as it adds a double colorless to our mana pool, but we can only activate it if we control 5 or more lands, but since we're ramping so much, that's not very difficult to enable. And last but not least, Kassig Wolfrun can potentially pump up one of our creatures by paying X, a green and a red, tapping it, giving target creature plus X plus O and trample until end of turn. So the general strategy when playing with Hensi is to make sure you develop your mana first, which is why I put such an emphasis on having a lot of lands and a lot of ramp cards, because without all those lands it's going to be difficult to get all our engines started, especially in the case our Hensi gets removed and we have to replay it. But even in the late game I'm happy to pay 7 or even 9 mana to replay Hensi, since we'll make most of that mana back when blitzing several creatures, so that's usually not a big deal. The deck can sometimes struggle to close out the game because you keep blitzing creatures as opposed to hard casting them, so just try and get as much value as possible while you can, and then if you feel like the tides are turning and you actually need to close out the game, then of course feel free to hard cast your creatures as well. So yeah, I've been having a ton of fun with this Hensi deck, the commander's very good and the power level of the deck's quite high as well, but as I've said I try to avoid infinite combos which end the game on the spot, since I prefer playing a longer grindy game where we get to extract as much value out of our cards as possible. Let's take a look at a sample hand. So we start with 7. And see if we want to keep. Alright, we've got 3 lands. We can play a Farseek on turn 2 to help us ramp. Maybe on the following turn play Hensi. And then we could already blitz our Gamekeeper to potentially put a powerful creature into play. Got Timeless Witness for a bit of recursion, and eventually Kogla can fight something, take out artifacts and enchantments. So this is a very nice opening hand. We even have a Temple to scry to find more lands, and our 8th card a greater good to provide more card advantage. Let's do another sample hand. Take 7. And have a look. Okay, we've got three lands and a soul ring, always exciting. And then we can play Evolutionary Leap as our kind of card draw engine. And we can ramp out an early war chief thanks to Blitz. And then Gear Hulk as removal. So this hand seems pretty solid. And our next card down, a Cultivate, even better. So now we could Cultivate on turn two thanks to Soul Ring and get the party started. All right, let's do one final sample hand since these are quite addictive. Count seven. And see what we've got. 
Okay, this at first glance looks like a one lander, but we actually have two lands with uh, Malachi Rebirth. So we do still need a third land before we can cast Kodama's Reach, but once we do, we can easily get up to five lands. And then we've got some removal with Chupacabra and Desecrator, and Balor and Ancient Copper Dragon, quite exciting to blitz with our commander. So I think we keep and just need to have a bit of faith that we find a third land with 42 total. That should be feasible. So let's see what our eighth card is. And yeah, we got Terra Ziatoros approving ground, so we've got perfect mana. Awesome. So yeah, if you maybe have the Riveteer's Rampage deck and you're looking to upgrade it, or you just want to get some individual cards for your latest commander project, then I recommend shopping from TCG Player, which is also what I've used to upgrade this particular deck. Great prices and fast shipping, and I also have an affiliate link down below in the description which you can use, which will support the channel, which is always greatly appreciated. And if you're in Europe, you can also shop from Card Market, which is another great resource to buy individual cards. And then the deck box I use here is the Twin Flip and Tray from Ultimate Guard. Of course, Ultimate Guard is a sponsor of the channel, but I've been using their products for a long time, so I can vouch for their quality. The Flip and Tray can house up to two full double-sleeved commander decks, and there's still room for tokens and additional dice in the middle compartment as well. And then I'm using the Katana sleeves, plus the Ultimate Guard inner sleeves as well, since you want to make sure to double-sleeve your valuable commander decks. So yeah, that's gonna wrap things up for today's video. Let me know in the comments if you would like to see more of these paper deck breakdowns in the future. But for now, I wanna thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also wanna thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.